Right, well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Lawrence Hendra, and I curated the exhibition here at the gallery today. Uh, Philip can't be here, unfortunately, so I'm afraid he's got me today. Um, thank you for joining us, though, this afternoon uh, for this paper focusing on average math uh, by Lydia Miller. Lydia is currently doing a PhD at York University on Ambrose McAvoy and his circle. Prior to this, worked here at the gallery as a researcher. Since leaving, Lydia has carried out, has carved out a reputation for herself as a specialist in early 20th century British art, and her research has seen her travel around the world, listening, looking at collections and studying archival material. Lydia's interest in McAvoy can be traced back to 2016 when she wrote an article for the Art UK website, which is a website detailing and illustrating paintings and public collections in the UK. Uh, the article was called from Ambrose McAvoy, a portrait painter of mood and temperament, and was the first article in almost 50 years to focus on this brilliant yet little known artist. Lydia has also been of great assistance to us when preparing this exhibition and when editing the manuscript, uh, the biographical manuscript, Divine People, which is on sale upstairs. It is a great privilege for us to invite Lydia here today, and we hope that you enjoy her lecture. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much for coming. If you can't hear me, say, okay, and I'll leave the microphone, but um, yeah, we'll see how it gets on, I think. Um, thank you so much for coming. Thanks, Lawrence. Lawrence has massively oversold me. <laughs> In every way. You know, when people do the intro, and you're like, oh, I don't know, sell it, but yeah. Um, so, my lecture. I hope this is a tune away as well, but okay, we'll see how we go. It's easy to look at the McAvoy portrait and see a beautiful sitter, usually a young woman in her prime, fashionably dressed and perfectly immortalising in paint. McAvoy's portraits have an ethereal quality to them. His palette is broad, and yet the colours that he uses are harmonious. We certainly wouldn't describe a McAvoy portrait as garish. His portraits are often flattering to his sitters. His style is contemporary, but unique. All of these qualities made McAvoy's work extremely popular in the late 1910s and through the 1920s, until his premature death in 1927. Today I want to think a little bit about how McAvoy got to this successful point in his career by looking at who inspired him. I want to pick apart McAvoy's career for you, and hopefully, hopefully, by the end of this lecture, you'll have a greater understanding of how McAvoy developed this mature style of portraiture. So let's begin. I think McAvoy's early career could be split into three different periods of influence. So the first one I'm going to start with is the Slade School of Art and afterwards, so it's between 1893 and 1903. I've been generous here, I've given him a whole decade. Um, the interiors period, which is our middle period, 1901 to 1912, and then finally we're going to end with the Whistlerian turning point, 1915. This sounds rather pretentious, but it will come clear as we go through. So starting with our first period, the Slayer School of Art and the years afterwards. Who influenced or who inspired McAvoy? On Saturday the 28th of October, 1893, Arthur Ambrose McAvoy was signed into the Slayer School of Fine Arts at the age of 16. I really, I really love these old ledgers. This is from UCL, um, so this is from the special collections there. And as you can see here, I'm going to pull you all over from the wires and break it but you can see McAvoy's name just here, halfway down, A.A. McAvoy. And this lovely sort of blank space all the way, and he's signed in here on the Saturday. We know that he stayed at the Slade until at least April 1898, as we have this lovely uh, admittance ticket uh, saying that he can study three days a week, which is signed by Frederick Brown. Um, it's a, it's saying that it's, um, he's there for three days a week. As soon as McAvoy arrived at the Slade, he was inspired by fashionable and often controversial artists of the day. His best friend, Augustus John, recorded in his autobiography that McAvoy's general appearance owing something to Whistler, whom he knew personally, and Aubrey Beardsley, whom he didn't comprised a straight, low fringe of black hair, a monocle, a high collar of shaded white, a black suit, and painted leather dancing pumps. He was, in fact, the perfect ring in black and white. <laughs> so we're going to talk a little bit about Whistler later on, so I won't go into that detail. 
But I just wanted to show you two pictures, one of McAvoy and one of Aubrey Beardsley next to each other. And you can see just how similar yes. they really are. So on the left, for, for those of you who hopefully do know, uh, McAvoy's on the left and you've got Aubrey Beardsley who's on the right. And the only difference really between them that I can see is the fringe. And thank God McAvoy's not got the fringe because he really is awful, I think. <laughs> um, so just to give you a, a little idea of what McAvoy looks like as well. As a slave, McAvoy would have become accustomed to copying the work of other artists. He would have studied Greek, Greco Roman, and Italian Renaissance casts in the antique room. He would have learnt about anatomy, and then he would have progressed to drawing from life. Frustratingly, the majority of McAvoy's drawings of the slave no longer exist. They would have been practice sketches that would have been thrown away at the end of each drawing session. He would have been encouraged to draw at life size, sometimes larger, and because of this, just the sheer size of the drawings made them pretty impractical to store. I don't want to dwell too much on what McAvoy was learning as a slave, because these weren't influences chosen by the artist. These were forced upon him as part of his training. What's more interesting are the friends that he had with the slave. During the 1890s, the slave was accepting a much higher proportion of female students to male students, which was unusual for the period. Because of this, McAvoy made a close group of male and female friends. Okay, I want you to bear with me, because there's a lot of names, but I promise you don't have to remember any of them. It's just to give you a, a flavor of who McAvoy's with during these years. So you've got Augustus John, and Benjamin Evans, who are probably McAvoy's closest friends with the slave. You've got some of the women of the group. You've got Ida Nettleship, who ends up marrying Augustus John. Gwen John, who's Augustus John's sister. You've got Ursula Turwitt. This is a really awful drawing. I'm, I'm sorry, I've not done her justice. She was beautiful, it looks horrible. Um, you've got Edna Waugh, who was seen to be a real child prodigy at the slave. Um, she was told to be the next, that she was going to become the next Burn Jones, but um, unfortunately, like most women did then, she got married and, and never really quite reached her full potential. You've got Gwen Salmond, who's um, very friendly with this circle. Grace Westry, who shares a flat with some of them. And then you've got the Salaman children, who were from quite a wealthy family and didn't really need to work for a living, but they studied the slave, um, just for something to do, I think, and to sort of better themselves creatively. You've got Michael Salaman, and then loads of his sisters went to the slave. I won't go into all of them, but You've got Bessie, you've got Louise, Dorothy, all went to the Slade. Did we get past the previous one? Excuse me. And then slightly later, you've got, uh, so in 1897, we've got Albert Rutherston, or Rothenstein at this period, um, who joins them at the Slade, who is the younger brother of William Rothenstein. William's slightly older than this group, but becomes sort of a very central figure in the, um, within the group and sort of helping inspire these young artists. And then of course you've got William Orton, who also joins in 1897. Don't worry, it gets less complex from here. <laughs> McAvoy's cohort was described by their tutor, Henry Tongs, as the first crisis of brilliance at the Slade. Subsequent years would be described, sorry, subsequent years were described living in the shadow of John Orton and McAvoy. Without going into too much detail, these artists significantly influenced each other. They shared studios together, they financially supported each other, and most importantly, they saved money on models by modeling for each other. <laughs> I wanted to show you who's, who's painting who at this period within the circle, just a few, um, a few images. I've dedicated a whole slide to this one because I think it's really fabulous. Um, so this is by William Orphan, and it shows Albert Rothenstein and his model. All right, have a look. Um, and I dedicate the whole side of this, so I just think it's a really wonderful image. You've got this very voluptuous, nude, this wonderful sort of woman who just absolutely dwarfs Albert to the left. And, you know, they're sat there in conversation. She's warming herself by the fire. He's smoking a pipe, and they're very comfortable with each other. I just, just think it's wonderful if you want to show that. <coughs> And then to put a few of them just on, on one slide together to give you an idea of, of who's painting who, you've got a lovely drawing um, of Ambrose McAvoy by Augustus John. This is in the National Portrait Gallery, as is this one, which is by William Orpen of Augustus John. You've got this lovely sort of triple <coughs> portrait of um, Gwen John at the back. You've got Ida Nettleship on the left and Ursula Turner on the right. And this is at Yale. You've got Gwen John's painting of Ida Nettleship and Gwen Salmon. 
Um, this, I think this is a really lovely portrait. This is when Gwen John, Ida Nettleship, and Gwen Salmon are together studying in Paris. And this is the first time that these girls are alone together, unchaperoned, having this wonderful, you know, independent time. I, I just think it's really lovely that they're sort of in this lovely Parisian apartment that's so sort of sparsely furnished because they can't afford any furniture. <laughs> and then you've got Ambrose McAvoy's painting of Gwen John, which is at the National Museum of Wales. So McAvoy and his friends were influencing each other at this period, but who else were they influenced by? Who was McAvoy influenced by? The most accessible artworks in London were in public collections, such as the National Gallery and the National Gallery's British Art, which is now the Tate. We also know that McAvoy studied at Sir John Stone's Museum in Mission and Fields, as we've got this um, reader's ticket showing that you can go and study the paintings there. And we also know that this group studied at the British Museum. And in fact, Augustus John remembers, I spent most of my spare time in the National Gallery, the British Museum and other collections, thus loading my mind with a confusion of ideas, which a lifetime hardly provides time to sort. <laughs> And the slave tutor that we've, all, we've heard about um, very briefly, Henry Tonks, says that his students should study more, should study the pictures in the National Gallery more, and the Aubrey Beardsley drawings in the fashionable yellow books less. <laughs> <laughs> and we know that McAvoy took this advice, as did a lot of his friends, and we actually know that, um, well, we've got a, a sketch of him working in the National Gallery, which is part of McAvoy's archive material. And these are on the same piece of paper front and back, so I wanted to show them side by side so you can really see it. Um, these were probably drawn by Augustus John, and on the left it says, at the National, and McAvoy's in the centre of two figures who, not 100% sure who they are, like, I don't want to sort of speculate too much, but these two um, figures who are clearly criticising his work, he's holding a palette in his hand, just in the centre there, I can't quite reach it, and um, I think he looks a little overwhelmed by the criticism that he's receiving. <laughs> And on the right, we've got him leaving the National Gallery, looking quite forlorn, probably over the criticism that he's just had, carrying these two heavy bags of artist materials. I wish John had shown it raining, because that would have given me more of an atmosphere. And you can see the National Gallery in the background, and to the right, we've got uh, St. Martin's Church in the Fields, um, to the far right as well, which you can definitely recognise. So we know McAvoy copied several old masters in the National Gallery, including Italian Renaissance paintings such as this, which is centre over his study by Catina, which is in the National Gallery still. We don't know where McAvoy's copy of this is. If anyone knows, do let us know, and uh, <laughs> I can photograph it. Um, but we know that McAvoy did copy this work because it's written about in a letter from a family friend. He also copied Veronese's The Rape of, uh, the Rape of Europa, and on the left we can see McAvoy's copy of it, and on the right we can see the original. As you see, McAvoy's copy needs a little bit of work. It also doesn't help my photographs very bad, but I hope that you can see just how close these two works are. And even better, he copied this piece by Titian. And um, again, you can see McAvoy's on the left and the original on the right. If you took all that yellow varnish off, which Lawrence will tell you about later, I'm sure, if you took all of that off, it would come up really nicely. It would look much more like the original. Um, but yeah, McAvoy copied this, and it took him two years sat in front of the painting in the National Gallery copying this. So he really is keen to copy old masters. <clears throat> as well as Renaissance paintings, McAvoy also made copies of 18th century British portraits, including Thomas Gainsborough's Margaret Gainsborough and William Pope Arkins's Psalter. And what's interesting about these two pieces that he's copying, obviously McAvoy's on the left, um, his original's on the right, we believe, What's interesting about these two paintings is that McAvoy is choosing to copy the uh, relations, the relatives of the, the artists. So as you're very well aware, I'm sure, Margaret Gainsborough was Thomas Gainsborough's daughter, and Mrs. Salter isn't a relative of Hogarth, but at the time that McAvoy was painting this copy, everyone believed that this was a portrait of Hogarth's sister. And we know this because well, it wasn't until some 
young art historian, I suppose, came along and had a look at the actual um, paintings and saw it said Mrs. Salter, who is a completely different woman. She's not Hogarth's sister at all. Um, but we actually know that McAvoy believes it to be Hogarth's sister as well because it's written in his diary. And um, I've just taken a little bit of this out of it, actually. I've not thought well about this. It's kind of far away. Um, so he writes, so this is on the 11th of October, it's a Wednesday, 1899, and he says, I have not written anything in my diary for some time. I have worked only fairly hard, which is a little disappointing, <laughs> and started painting at the National Gallery again, Hogarth's sister. I then added this little bit on the end, because Augustus John and McAvoy had this lovely rivalry, and they're sort of a little bit horrible about each other often, and he says, John's return from France last Saturday. He takes himself more seriously and pompously than ever. <laughs> so how are McAvoy's later portraits, seen all around us in this exhibition, related to copying old master portraits or paintings? Quite simply, copying old masters taught McAvoy how to lay a paint. He learned that they started with different monochrome bases, and depending on what sort of effect they wanted, they then layered thin coloured glazes over the top of them. Daphne Baring, who again, just here, don't know, um, she sat to McAvoy several times as a child from 1916, and she remembered in 1971, uh, in his letters to Lord Chilton, she said, he began the picture in monochrome as was his usual practice, sometimes in brown, sometimes, as in this instance, in blue. He said it was the method of Titian and the Venetians and Gainsborough, and who could know better? Finally, for this part of um, this part of the lecture, I'd like to look a little bit at Rembrandt, so I'm going to flip over to Rembrandt quickly. Rembrandt inspired several of McAvoy's friends, Augustus John, Benjamin Evans and McAvoy, the three of them together here, all travelled to Amsterdam together in 1898 to visit the Rembrandt exhibition at the newly built Stadelijk Museum. This exhibition displayed 124 paintings and 350 drawings by Rembrandt and was held to coincide with the coronation of Wilhelmina, Queen of the Netherlands. The Stadelijk exhibition represented a new 19th century interest in Dutch Golden Age artists and for McAvoy, John and Evans, it clarified Rembrandt as one of the inspirational artists from whom to learn. There are several references to Rembrandt amongst McAvoy's estates, including letters from Augustus John in the summer of 80, written in the summer of 1899 from Bath to Stillmere. He writes, The country recalls the mountainous of Rembrandt's etchings. The more mountainous of Rembrandt's etchings, I wish you were here. He then remembers a dream that he had about McAvoy and Rembrandt. I spent last night in the company of you and Rembrandt. Rembrandt cuffed my head for making some of the <laughs> In September of that same year, 1899, McAvoy wrote in his diary over several days describing that he had copied different Rembrandt etchings and paintings. Several of the Rembrandt sketches still survive amongst McAvoy's estate material, um, which they have here. I just want to show you a few of the sketches that he made. I won't go through them all. But I'm sure that you recognise the top left-hand corner, McAvoy copy, uh, Rembrandt's self-portrait at the age of 63. You've got the rat catcher to the right of that. You've got um, Rembrandt's mother, sketch of Rembrandt's mother here as well. And I think that McAvoy copied all of these out of the same book. Might be wrong, you can test my theory, but I think he copied them out of the same book. It was a book that was titled Rembrandt by H. Knapford, and this was owned by Augustus John and was passed around all the different friends within the circle that we've seen. And I think this because I found this sketch, you can see a much more finished sketch um, of, a, of a Rembrandt etching above and then a, a small head underneath. And in the Knapford book, these two gentlemen are side by side. McAvoy also experiments with Rembrandt's etchings by working them up in paint, which is quite interesting, I think. And Possibly quite unusual, but I'm not sure. He writes in his diary, Then after lunch I took up a little painting I had of a Rembrandt etching, The Beautiful Woman. I had sketched it lighter in black and white, then when it was dry, put yellow ochre and vermilion on. I dragged it over the surface so that the white showed through. When I glazed it with raw sienna, 
to start with low theater tight. It had a wonderfully rich and charming appearance. It looked something like a Rossetti, only better. <laughs> and I put some more paint on and tried to get it more definite, but rather spoilt the effect, but it may be good to work on. Not only does this diary entry give us a really good idea of Matt Boy's work today and the sorts of work that he's copying during this period, but it gives us a fantastic insight into the step-by-step -step process of this layering of thin, coloured glazes and the sorts of effects that he tried to imitate. I always think it's really interesting that he describes his creation as something like a Rossetti when in fact he starts with a red crown. <laughs> bizarre. I'd like to move on to the second period that we're looking at tonight. So this is the interiors period, 1901 to 1912. From about 1901, McAvoy moved away from copying other artists' work as a training method, and instead developed his own compositions in the form of carefully constructed genre paintings. These are significantly smaller than the later portraits that you can see here. They're realistic interiors, influenced by 17th century Dutch paintings by artists such as Vermeer, Gerard de Bourg, and uh, Peter de Hook as well. During this period, there was increasing interest in 17th century Dutch masters, following the rediscovery of Rembrandt, sorry, the rediscovery of Vermeer and the publication of his catalogue Renommee in 1866. <coughs> Amongst McAvoy's estate papers, we have several postcards, it's like hundreds of postcards of all sorts of different works, but there's a collection of Dutch old master paintings, um, which are sort of on these old-fashioned postcards, which is rather lovely, I think. Although these postcards feature people, they often appear secondary to the interiors that surround them. In McAvoy's early interiors, he attempts to imitate aspects of these works, for instance, the manipulation of light through windows, which I'll just go on to. I want to show you this with Orson, I'm sorry, this picture's not very good, but I'm not sure where the original is. Uh, so you've got Autumn here, which shows this um, lovely young woman sat on a chaise lounge, reading a letter and looking pensively out of the window. And you see McAvoy really try to manipulate this light. Her body's casting a bit more of a shadow on this side of the chaise lounge. And then you've got these lovely thick curtains, which are pouring all of the light down towards her and sort of framing her nicely in light. You also see this with the convalescent and the letter as well. So the convalescent shows Mary McAvoy, Ambrose's wife, um, recovering from um, quite a serious illness at this point. Um, she is actually convalescing. And the light is sort of pouring down onto her. McAvoy's closed the curtains in the middle, and then they use the shutters to actually um, bring the sort of the light down from her. And again with the letter as well, this figure standing in the in the in the window, like causing this chiaroscuro across the room and across her face and her body. And then we've also got the music room, which really feels quite Dutch to me as well. It's not the, it's not the, the windows and the lighting in this one, it's the, it's the instruments that she's, that she's got. She's holding a lute, uh, sorry, she's holding a violin, but she's not holding it as she would be playing it. She's holding it more like a lute or a theorbo or something like that, which is um, the sort of the prominent instrument, with, instrument within a Dutch painting. And finally, we've got In a Doorway, which was painted in 1905 by McAvoy. And I think this work takes influence from this Dutch master. I thought it was a good sign. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we do see this one. Uh, by Gerard uh, de Bork, and this is his gallant conversation. What's interesting with Sport's image is that you can't see what his female standing figure here is doing. You can't see what she's looking at, what her facial features are, nothing. You can only admire her beautiful dress, her beautiful, I presume, satin dress from the back. McAvoy changes this. He decides to erase all the other people around him, and instead he turns her figure very slightly and shows that in fact she's reading. The modern material obviously replaces the, uh, the lovely sort of Dutch satin material, the dress that she's got on, on the right, but again, you've got, it's all about the dress. You've got this, it's beautifully pulled around the waist. You can see it all sort of gathered and then falling towards the floor as well. So I think this is where he takes his, his inspiration from. The influence of Dutch genre paintings on McAvoy's early work 
is referred to several times in contemporary literature and also the literature after his death. So Frank Rutter, um, who was writing for the Sunday Times, who's you know, very well known as a critic of the time, he writes, still more delightful are the little interiors with figures, soft, all-pervading lighting worthy of a Dutch 17th century genre painter. And then just a little recap to get through, in case you've got a bit lost at all of this. Uh, so these earliest interiors, they're significantly smaller than all of the portraits that you've got here. They measure about 20 by 17 inches. I'm, I'm not very good with inches in my photo centuries, but they're not very big. However, between the smallest interiors and then all of the portraits that you can see in the gallery today, you've also got a period of slightly larger interiors which feature an increasing element of portraiture. There are four of these that I'd like to quickly talk about, and all of them appear to have been painted in the same room, which is McAvoy's studio at 107 Grayson Road. So you've got the earring, which I hope some of you have seen upstairs, which is so beautiful and so lovely. Actually, a lot smaller, even though you sort of look at the dimensions of these, these pieces, it was a lot smaller than I thought it was going to be. I thought it was going to be really massive like when I first saw it. So you've got the earring, which is on display here, and you've got the lute, an eight, which uh, attracted us down recently to Johannesburg Art Gallery. And I'd never seen a picture of this in colour before, I'd only ever seen black and white. And it wasn't until I, I got in touch with them and said, oh my PhD won't pay for me to fly seven and a half thousand miles to see your painting in person, please can you send me pictures, that I realised that in fact these two women are wearing exactly the same clothes. And actually, we have the same sitter here as well. The model of these paintings was Mademoiselle Anais Bolin, who was employed by the McAvoys as a French governess for their son, Michael. From the moment she arrived at the McAvoys' house, however, McAvoy, Ambrose McAvoy, completely monopolised her time, and she ended up modelling for him for two years. I'm not sure if he did any teaching, <laughs> really, in that time. And as you can see in the, um, I want to have a little look at the lute to get it on its own. As you can see in the lute, there's this Dutch interior vibe again. Not only is she holding the lute, which I know is <coughs> obviously very Dutch, but also you have this multi-room perspective. So you have these multiple rooms going backwards. She's stepping into a room, she steps out of another room, you've got the stairway, up the stairway, and then you've got a door that shuts at the very top. And again, you see this, I wanted to use a postcard rather than the actual painting. Again, you see this in some of the postcards that McAvoy's got of these Dutch paintings. You've got this sort of room here with these um, with the dog and the, the two um, figures here. You've got a child that's pay playing in this sort of intermediary space. And then behind it, you've got the courtyard and another building behind it as well. All sort of features of these Dutch paintings. Painting in A's allows McAvoy to reinterpret Vermeer. Vermeer is well known for painting women performing everyday yet intimate tasks, such as sparkling jewellery. <coughs> and with the earring, we see McAvoy imitating just this. Just to give you a reminder of something like Vermeer's A Woman with a Pearl Necklace, you see her here sort of fastening this beautiful string of pearls and looking at herself in the mirror as she does it on the wall. Um, perhaps one of the most striking comparisons that we can make with the earring is this wonderful painting on the left by Gerard Dow, which shows a young woman sat in a mirror. She's not fastening an earring. She's curling her hair, and her maid is helping her to do this as well. But on her left ear, she wears this lovely drop pearl earring. And you might be mistaken that actually she's fastening the other earring into her ear, which she's not. But McAvoy is attempting to copy this pose. So he's fastening the earring. She's holding the earring up to her ear here. So we can see in both paintings, the young women's wrists are sort of delicately, delicately exposed. They've got sort of this, um, this drapery that's hanging away from the body in red and pink respectively. And even the sort of colours of the carpet in McAvoy's painting are again mirrored in this wonderful cloth that's on top of the table in the Dow painting as well. McAvoy wouldn't have seen this painting firsthand. This was at Munich Art Gallery at the time that he was painting the earring. However, it was reproduced in at least two 
uh, publications at the time, one in 1903 and one in 1910. So it's possible that's why we're looking there. The other two paintings that I want to touch upon are the interior and their reprise. Both painted by McAvoy, both these interior paintings again. And we can also say that both, both of them compared to Vermeer, which we'll talk a bit more about. If we start with La Reprise, this painting was painted in the same room, which is McAvoy's studio at 107 Broughton Road. Uh, both of them were painted in the, same, in the same studio. You can see this wonderful green wall behind, and also you can see the ship painting in both of them as well, which shows that um, this is in fact the same room. This is also supposed to be the same model, but I think McAvoy actually made that age look very different in this uh, right hand painting hair down, it's completely sort of reinvented her look. Like Vermeer's lace maker, Anais is working on a piece of cloth. She's embroidering it or mending it. And the cloth is sort of in this similar yellow colour that mirrors the lace maker's breast. And the colours in the blue of the Vermeer are sort of highlighted in this very sort of delftware style jug, water jug that we've got to the right. Looking at interior, interior is quite unusual as a composition for McAvoy. I don't think I've ever really seen anything like this painting. He doesn't do a lot of um, sort of finished nudes like this. And although we don't know where this picture is, and the photographs only black and white, I think if you saw a colour image of it, you would know that this is also in the same studio and that the walls would be green. You've got obviously the easel, which I know is perfectly transportable from the e from the earring and um, interior. But you've also got this lovely carpet. You see this carpet that's got a um, that's got a sort of uh, I don't know what you call it a border around it, and you've got the same carpet that's in interior as well. I think interior could have been inspired by this piece by Vermeer, the art of painting. You've got the uh, the nude, the model on the left. In both of them, you've got the artist's easel on the right in both of them, you've got the map behind and this lovely map of always lines up all of these paintings behind this nude in interior, this lovely expanse of patterned floor in both, and you can also see the ceiling in both. And what's interesting about interior is that this is the first time that we see McAvoy's studio ceiling, which doesn't sound interesting, but the fact it's got a skylight on just gives you an idea of where the light's coming within his studio. If you don't believe this as well, I, um, <laughs> I think both of these works are sort of very voyeuristic as well. Uh, Vermeer has very carefully pulled away the curtain, but he's sort of spying on this very intimate scene between the artist and the sitter. And again, we're sort of voyeuristically looking at this um, wonderful nude who has no idea that we're standing here, watching her from afar. What's interesting about McAvoy as well is that he wouldn't actually be able to paint her from this angle. She's stopped for a second. Again, I think she's probably warming herself by a fireplace. As you can see, the sort of outline of the um, mantelpiece. You see slightly coming over from the easel? So I think she's probably sitting there and McAvoy's trotted off to do something else and um, is going to come back and paint her afterwards. I'd like to move on to the final bit of our lecture, which is the Whistlerian Turning Point, 1915. All of the works that we've looked at so far look like a world away from McAvoy's most famous paintings. His style does change, and I can't pretend that he takes all of the features of the Rembrandt, the Titian, or the Vermeer into his later portraits. However, all of the influences that we've looked at and that we've been taught about tonight um, really have shown that he learns how to carefully layer coloured glazes, he, he learns how to use these coloured groundings to work up the sitter's face, and all of the details that we've learned from these artists that we've looked at so far. So when did McAvoy's style change, and who inspired him? It's time to move on to Whistler. James McNeil Whistler was friends with McAvoy's father, Captain McAvoy. I won't go into too many details about this because it can be a bit complicated. But Captain McAvoy met Whistler's brother, who was a doctor, whilst fighting the Confederates with the Confederates in the American Civil War. When Captain McAvoy emigrated to England, Dr. Whistler introduced his brother, who was the artist. Whistler died in 1903, but in 1915, so this is 12 years later and a year into the First World War, 
There is a Whistler exhibition at the Colnaghi Gallery in New Bond Street, just up the road from the gallery here, actually. According to this review, this exhibition was put on to raise funds for the professional classes War Relief Council, and McAvoy was described, sorry, and Whistler was described as representing the freedom of the artist while the war was going on. Overall, this review isn't particularly complimentary to Whistler's work, but at the end of it, and the very last sentence of it, we see this line. The Thames grey and silver, and remember that no one could imitate that. There is not the master, for he never had enough command of himself to be a master, but the poet who did succeed now and again among the failures. And when he succeeds, we forget the failures. This is the painting that they were talking about. McAvoy would have known Whistler's Thames views well, and living on the embankment himself, he also painted the river. So again, this is the Whistler, and then in 1912, McAvoy paints this. Whistler's comp composition is portrait rather than landscape. McAvoy's colours are slightly warmer, but I think overall most people can see a comparison between these two works. You've got this solitary sailing boat on the boat, you've got this industrialisation of London in the background, looking over the river, and even the style of it, sort of how he's stylistically producing this work, is very similar to the Whistler. I know what you're thinking, what has McAvoy's 1912 painting got to do with an exhibition view in 1915 of a Whistler painting? To be honest, nothing really, other than that, that McAvoy was clearly aware of Whistler's Thames grey and silver, regardless of whether he read the, um, the exhibition review in 1915. Excuse me. However, what is interesting is that this painting that was reviewed in the Times in 1915, on the left, in 1915, at this same time, McAvoy was painting this. As you can see here, McAvoy is using the same colours that Whistler has used for his portraits. And perhaps McAvoy did read the review and perhaps this inspired him to paint this beautiful work. This is essentially a reinvention of Whistler's title. The title concentrates on the colours and therefore the painterly form rather than the sitter. This portrait is of McAvoy's sister-in-law, Marjorie Gwendolyn McAvoy who before she was married was Marjorie Notley. And I think this is probably one of McAvoy's most accomplished works. In fact, I think it's upstairs, is it upstairs on? Yeah. yeah, it's upstairs, yeah. Um, because, oh yeah, I can see it so well. Um, unfortunately, this side of McAvoy's family had a very sad ending. Marjorie Notley was only 15 when she married Ambrose's brother, Charles, on the 8th of July, 1911. She died of TB at the age of 25, in 1921. Her husband Charles drank himself into an early grave and the couple had two sons, Charles and Patrick, both of whom were killed in the Second World War. It's really pretty awful. Ambrose McAvoy sold Marjorie's portrait to Manchester Art Gallery in 1925 and he wrote to them and said that the art gallery must use both names, silver and grey, as a portrait of Mrs Charles McAvoy. This allowed Marjorie to be remembered beyond her Whistlerian title. Let's move on to a slightly less sad portrait. In 1915, McAvoy also painted this work, and unfortunately, we've only got a black and white image of this because the original was destroyed in a house fire at the um, at uh, Captain Harry Graham's house, which is really awful. So this is the image that we sort of got of it. But McAvoy here is clearly inspired by Whistler's. Harmony in Grey and Green, Miss Cicely Alexandra, as you can see here. And this isn't the only time that McAvoy uses this, this um, sort of wonderful contrapposto pose sort of striding forward. He also uses it for a portrait of Tink, which is published in Colour Magazine in 1921. In using this pose for Virginia Graham, McAvoy inserts his portrait into the well-known chronology of European painters who have painted women standing just like this. This may, you may recognise this painting by Goya of the Black Duchess, portrait of the Duchess of Alba. You see her in the same position in 1890, sorry, 1797. 
And then this went on to inspire uh, Manning to produce this Spanish painting of Lola de Valence in 1862. McAvoy, oh, sorry, Whistler, of course, inverts the image and turns Cecily the other way, and then McAvoy brings her back round again um, for Virginia. Virginia is younger than Whistler's sitter, but both children are seen to be in these rather elaborate party dresses. McAvoy also takes out the horizontal planes out for Whistler. He sort of creates almost this uphill sort of, sort, sort, sort of channel for Virginia to be standing in. The room looks very comfortable. Her hair is a bit you know, curly and beautiful, but it's a bit of a mess. It's not immaculate. And I think overall there's sort of this modernism, this bohemianism that perhaps you don't really get with the Whistler. It's a little bit, um, it's a little bit sort of straight and she, she looks rather unhappy as well. I think she was quite unhappy. Finally, don't worry, I'm coming to an end, everyone. Finally, the painting that I want to end on, and hopefully this will tie the lecture together a little bit more, is this painting. Again, painted in 1915. This is a portrait titled Madame. This painting also made McAvoy almost, it made him famous overnight really. After this painting was done, there was sort of a flood of portrait commissions coming in for McAvoy with sort of all of the, particularly the British elite. It was exhibited at the National Portrait Society in March 1915, and then at the Musée de Luxembourg between 1915 and 1922. It's now in Musée d'Orsay, if anyone wants to see it, I think it's on display there. It depicts Mary, McAvoy's wife. She's standing over a fireplace and is reminiscent of some of the interiors that we've already looked at. You see the element of portraiture to all of these, but they're all set within interiors. And again, this is not the first time that McAvoy's used this pose. He paints Myrtle in 1913, which was clearly inspired by Symphony in White Number no. 2, The Little White Girl by Whistler. P.G. Connolly, the famous art critic, reviewed Madame in the National Portrait Society 1915 exhibition for the Observer. And he writes this incredibly long review of McAvoy's work. Don't worry, I'm not going to read it out to you. Everyone's like, please don't read it out. I'm not going to read it out for you. But just to give you an idea of just how much he's focusing on McAvoy's work in this review. He describes um, McAvoy's painting as being the clue of the entire exhibition but which may, without exaggeration, be described as a masterpiece. He describes Madame as holding you spellbound from the moment you enter the gallery. And he picks up on a rather interesting observation of the McAvoy portrait of Madame as well. He says that there's a very slight blue on the reflection in the mirror, and that it's a marvel of subtle observation. And this is what he's talking about. This reflection in the mirror, which I think you sometimes can look at these paintings and just think somebody's really poorly photographed this, but actually, this is a wonderful, <laughs> really bad to say, um, this is actually a really wonderful um, observation by this art critic, really draws your attention to it. And we've all seen it the light streaming in through the window, and it comes right back at you um, again, sort of hitting the back wall of the mirror, uh, this sort of lovely blue. And we might be able to compare this to the Vermeer that we've already looked at. You can see this lovely blue reflection around the window, the window frame here, and of course you've got her beautiful face reflected in the, um, the four panes of glass as well. And the other thing that um, Connolly picks up on with the Madame painting in his review, he says, in some way, the picture is Rembrandt-esque, but only insofar as it suggests that Rembrandt might have painted like that if he had lived through the age of impressionism. <laughs> Wonderful thought, I think. So Madame, with its culmination of elements of Rembrandt, Vermeer and Whistler, seems like a good point to end this lecture. This painting was the turning point for McAvoy and the mature style of portraiture that he goes on to produce that we can see here. Thank you for coming on this journey of artists who inspired Ambrose McAvoy. Are there any questions? Why do you think he took such a long time to start portrait painting, given that it was probably more profitable than doing other types of uh, work? To be honest, I'm not 100% sure. I think, I think he thinks that he writes about his training at the Slade as it, there's sort of one, there's one moment that he writes about the Slade and says that the training that he's given 
isn't quite what you wanted because you wasn't very happy with it. And I think maybe he just wanted to further develop with his own sort of self-education. And that's why he started copying old masters because he thought there was so much more to learn. But I'm not really sure. A lot of his contemporaries describe Maxwell as being very slow and very slow at doing anything. And um, Edna Moore actually says, I'm surprised you get anything done. Um, so I'm a Lawrence in thought. I don't know if anyone else has got Lawrence, do you have any? Any views on that particularly? No, no, but that actually leads me on to the question that I was going to ask, which was, uh, how do you think he was, Macron was viewed um, so as a person amongst his friendship? Because obviously Augustus John had a reputation of being a sort of young man that was obviously annoyed a lot of people yeah. in the process. But how do you think Macron was viewed? I think he was viewed very well. He seemed to get on with everybody. He doesn't really fall out with anybody in this period. Um, I think there's, there's a few letters where he moans to his wife, so this is slightly later on, from 1902, he moans to his wife saying that, oh, this sitter didn't do what I wanted and she's being a bit difficult, but he never actually falls out with anybody. So I think with his contemporaries, he's viewed, he's viewed um, sort of very well, and he has a good reputation amongst the sitters as well. Um, yeah. yeah. Did he have a gallery or an agent? I mean, his whole culture seems to have really got going in the First World War. There was yeah. a time when people were mining in their pennies. How did he attract commissions? Well, he, so from about 1916, so obviously this is mid First World War, he meets, um, he meets Mrs. Baring, who's a fallen uh -huh. upstairs, and that's really how his name gets out there with the British um, aristocracy really, and the young just sort of higher echelon of society. And it's through that painting that then she's introduced, she introduces him to other friends, and it's really through word of mouth. But he does have his own solo exhibition at the Carfax Gallery in 1907, and William Rockefeller, who I think, <coughs> arranged that for him. Um, so yeah, he's trying to get out there. But I think he really becomes the successful artist that we see now, um, sort of through the later portraits from about 1916. So much later, I mean, he finishes the Slade in you know, 1898. It's a massive gap before he really becomes very famous. And answer your question. Do you know what he died of? Yeah, he died of pneumonia. Oh. It was a very undramatic death, actually. He got pneumonia within sort of a week, and, and he's dead within a week, which is really awful. Um, and his grandson, um, uh, Charles, who sort of owns all of the McAvoy estate material, he told me that McAvoy was working in a very damp studio that had just been replastered, and he continued to be told, don't work in this damp studio until the plaster's dry. And he said, no, no, I've got so many commissions to do, I need to keep working. And they, um, he thinks that maybe that's why Macaulay got pneumonia, because he just did that damp studio. The, the studio paintings that he did, which were not to Vermeer, were they for himself, or were they for the art world to say, oh, this guy's amazing, <coughs> or were they just yeah. to him? I think he did add touches to himself, but he exhibited all these works at the New English Art Club. Um, so all of these sort of the mirror inspired paintings were, were there. Um, from, actually, it's part of my thesis, one of the big questions that I'm really looking at, is how McAvoy was, um, was trying to sort of battle with these tensions between the commercial artwork and, and art world and producing these you know, wonderful portrait commissions and actually producing work that was you know, considered very sort of scholarly and artistic, and, and how he gets the balance right um, between those two different um, different things. So it's still something I'm trying to work out when it comes to time. How did he view himself? Because some people who end up being portrait painters kind of think, oh, I've kind of sold, sold out to commerciality. How did, how did he view that? Did he think he was like one of the great masters but, but never really did that, or did he just did he love portrait painting? He always says that he didn't love portrait painting, a bit like Gainsborough, but I think he did really, otherwise you'd just change, wouldn't you, do something else. But he, I think he wants to start off by doing these interiors and making them sort of commercially viable, but nobody really wants to buy them because everybody else is doing the same thing. And what's really interesting with McAvoy is that he creates very much an artistic brand for himself from about 1916. So he's painting all of these sort of wonderful sitters and, um, these, the, I mean, all of the women that you sort of see here, and his mainly women, could choose to be painted by anybody they wanted. So why would you want to be chosen? Why would you choose McAvoy? And why would you want to be painted by him? And I think the answer is, is that you can really pick out a McAvoy amongst any other sort of British artist of the period, including you know, John and Orton 
And all of these paintings, you can sort of stop and look at that point and say, actually, that's something different. I want him to paint me. And yeah, I think that's what he moves into. And I think that's what he wants to create for himself. And he wants to support his family more than anything else. In the letters, you get this really clear idea. He's such a family man. He wants to make money for his family, give them all a better life. And he gets on this, this sort of new wave of producing these beautiful portraits and not really knowing when to stop, which is why he works himself into an early grave, really. What did he charge for a painting? Um, at the absolute height of his fame, he was charging about a thousand to twelve hundred pounds for a painting. Um, I'm not sure what he's charging for sort of restaurant, but it, it very much was on whether he liked the bitter as well. You see a few letters where he's charging like a phenomenal amount of money because he's not that keen on the person that he's painting. And then for friends, he's like, yeah, I'll go for 200 pounds, don't worry about it. Um, so yeah, there's a real sort of uh, price range, but yeah. Um, somebody says, uh, I can't remember who it is now, but somebody writes that he's charging a thousand pounds for portraits and he's driving around in a Rolls Royce at the height of his success. Yes, I was going to say at that time, I think a Model T Ford cost about a hundred pounds, yeah. so it's an interesting... It gives you a good idea as to, yeah. <laughs> No. So I was going to say, on that note, the, the, the part of the uh, research process for the exhibition, we actually did find a letter in which he referred to charging £12,000 for a group portrait of a yeah. particularly wealthy family from Long Island. So I think, I think your point about him basically charging uh, yeah. what he could get away with is certainly, um, certainly applied to Macro, and I thought that was a really particularly large amount. That really is. <laughs> yeah, that really is. And he seems to charge the Americans a lot more, <laughs> more than the British citizens. Whereas no. the, the, the paintings of the younger women, yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, I, I, ca I came here thinking, oh, 1920s, mm, you know, okay. I, I was just absolutely blown away. Yeah. I think they're absolutely fabulous. They're so really as you gorgeous. say, they are paintings of women. Yeah. And it is so good to find good paintings of women. Yeah. He's known, I mean, he is known more for the paintings of women. And what's interesting is that, like you say, it is quite an unremarkable portrait, but when you know a little bit more about Claude Johnson, um, he was such good friends with McAvoy, and they really... Oh, indeed. Um, yeah, and they really, um, you know, they were more like family, to be honest, and, and McAvoy came, um, Claudia, um, who, who was known sort of more as Joan or Tink, um, underneath as well, uh, painted the daughter several times, and painted all the family members several times, but do you know what I mean? It's a bit of a, it's a different portrait of Claude Johnson. Mm. I, actually, you, you said earlier that he drove. You, you said earlier he drove. He actually drove around in a Rolls Royce. Yeah, he did. In view of his connections, I bet he got a decent discount. He did. I'm not sure if he did actually from John Johnson, but yeah. Um, and, and there's loads of letters from um, Johnson saying you must replace your Buick with a Rolls Royce, like. And, and <laughs> <laughs> very good, yeah.